My name is Linda Marban. I'm the CEO of Capricorn. We're a publicly traded company. I show this forward-looking statement to let you know that some of the things I say, um, maybe things my legal team will be pulling their hair out over in a few hours. So Capricorn is a publicly traded biotech company. And let me just say that um, I'm going to sort of walk you through who the company is, the therapies that we have um, in our pipeline, and, but I'm also going to sort of elucidate on how we built the company because it's been a, a little bit of a non-traditional model. So we were founded in 2005 out of intellectual property from the University of Rome and Johns Hopkins University, and that was our cardiosphere and our cardiosphere derived cell technology. And then in November 2013, we merged with Nile Therapeutics to become uh, a publicly traded company under the symbol of CAPR. Now this is where we get a little bit unique in our story, and I had the um, opportunity to, to listen to some of the conversations next door a bit earlier about how to fund and funding climate. And I think one of the things that we are all plagued with in this field is that funding regenerative medicine is not easy. In fact, almost virtually impossible at times. So you have to find other ways to uh, colloquially skin that cat. And the way that we did it um, was to bring in a very small amount of seed money as an equity investment. To this point, we brought in $12 million in equity funding, and we have a phase two clinical program, another product that's coming into the clinic, um, another clinical program that's starting, and two products in our pipeline. So only $12 million in equity. How have we uh, done that? Well, we've done it by accessing all of the publicly available monies that we could find, including a very large program from CIRM um, in order to fund our clinical trial work. So to this point, we've brought in $39.5 million in non-dilutive capital, and that's how we've funded the company thus far uh, to, this point of, to the point of becoming a public company. We have uh, three sets of products in our pipeline, the cardiosphere derived cells, um, and I'll be telling you about those and, and their journey in the clinic in just a few moments. Uh, Sendaritide and CUNP, it's a natriuretic peptide. It's not a regenerative medicine product, but it's one uh, that we're very interested in, and it's a nice diversification of our pipeline, but allows us to stay true to our mission of treating heart disease. And then we have an exosome product, and that one I think I'm probably the most excited about, and so I'm going to um, keep that quiet until I get to the end, and you can join me in your excitement, hopefully, as well. And we have uh, licenses with top academic institutions. Two seconds here, because I know I have uh, 23 and a half minutes, I think, is what Aubrey uh, sent us in an email, so um, hopefully somebody's kind of catch, give me that extra 30 seconds if I need it. Um, this is just the breakdown of that non-dilutive capital that I told you about, and we're, we're good at uh, working with the National Institutes of Health, the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, and we did a big pharma deal with uh, Janssen, which is the wholly owned subsidiary of J&J, &J, late last year. This conference, I'm excited that I can focus a little bit on science and not on business. If you have questions about the Janssen deal that I don't cover as I go through, um, I'll be circulating around in this orange sweater so you can find me later. Okay, whoops. So the, the disease that we're looking to treat is, is uh, heart disease and primarily the development of and then end stage heart failure. And when you have a heart attack, blood flow uh, to, is blocked to the distal part of the tissue and ultimately that tissue dies and ultimately is minutes to hours. And then what happens is the heart begins to change its structure, and it changes its structure just like any other muscle in your body would change its structure because of the extra load put on it by its scar. Up until about 10 years ago, the, the dogma in our field was that all you could do uh, when you had that paradigm, first adverse remodeling, that's the changing of the shape, the dimensions, and the pressures that are able to be exerted by the heart to feed the body, adverse remodeling, and then ultimately heart failure, which has a five-year, 50% mortality rate. Uh, the only thing that we could do is work to strengthen the muscle that remained and reduce the load that was on the heart. And so the idea of regenerative medicine was something that we never even possibly considered. So the last 10 years has been an explosion in our ability to think about how to treat this paradigm. We have two clinical programs. One is targeting the remodeling process, hopefully will attenuate the development of heart failure. Another is working on uh, the advanced uh, heart failure paradigm and that population of people who are already quite sick. Our first clinical trial was called Caduceus. Uh, we started as an academically sponsored clinical trial, so the company um, in order to keep our burn rate low, stayed virtual for a while. Caduceus was a trial that was done jointly by Cedar sinai Medical Center and Johns Hopkins University. 
Um, it was an intracoronary delivery. That means the same catheter that would be used to deliver the stent in the patients that had had a heart attack is then again used. But this one, it has like a little bit of a, a needle on it. We can put the cells right through it and inject it right to where the injury is. And it was 25 patients, uh, 17 gut cells, and eight were standard of care controls. This was considered a phase 1B trial because we had a control group and we looked for hints of efficacy. And the results were published in 2012 in The Lancet. This uh, figure shown here is, is the major data point uh, that we found uh, with the Caduceus trial. And it's a, it's a busy slide, um, but one that I think makes some really interesting points. Let me also say this is the first time in the heart we saw um, evidence of what we now have come to call therapeutic regeneration. And that's actually the idea that the heart does something with that scar. So the scar size went down both six and 12 months post uh, delivery of cells. And the, the clear bars and scar mass is delta scar mass change in scar shown on the left. What you can see is the clear bars of those patients that got the best medicine had to offer. And they confirmed um, what I said before, which is that we can't do much about the scar once it's established. On the right side of the, of the bar graph, you see the change in viable mass. That is living, beating, functional heart tissue. And again, although you can barely see it, the clear bars are those patients that got the best uh, medical therapy, and we saw no change in viable mass. So just to be clear, uh, so when you, when you see zero here, zero is where the patients came into the study. So that's their scar and their new viable mass at the time they entered the study. And then how they move is what happened both at six and 12 months. And so we saw this marked reduction in scar size. And so we didn't quite know uh, what to make of that. Nobody had ever shown that before. So we decided to go back to the literature to see what we could find in terms of the potential relevance of this finding. And what we found is, is uh, shown here. So there's a, a large body of literature, and it's growing. I think uh, at last look, there was you know, several thousand papers on PubMed which um, looked at the effect of scar size and clinical outcomes, the effect of scar size on heart disease, blah, blah, blah. This one is a nice one. The data shown in this Kaplan-Meier survival curve was collected by Ed Wu and his colleagues at Northwestern. We had nothing to do with that data selection or data collection. And what he um, ultimately was able to find that people who had a big heart attack, more than 18 and percent of their heart was affected, had a very high risk of bad things happening downstream. So another heart attack, a stroke, death, another way of, of uh, confirming that they had bad heart disease. If you had a small heart attack, that was your chance, less than 18.5% of your heart affected, to take a deep breath, go to the gym, maybe eat some more meat chips with low fat. <laughs> Sorry, I love those. <laughs> um, and uh, have a chance to, to you know, think about evaluating your life low risk. Well, we found when we looked at the Caduceus data, and again, this is a superimposition of data, so it's, it's not a real measure, but it's certainly something that makes us hopeful. And I think one thing that's nice about this conference is it's, it's filled with a lot of hope is that we saw patients that had large heart attacks, those that had a heart attack that was bigger than 24% of their heart, um, and those were all of the patients in our group, both the treated and the control, started with big heart attacks, um, had a high risk of events. Those that got cells had a 40% reduction in the size of their scar, which took them from a high risk group, potentially, to a low risk group, moving them from a scar size of 24% to 12.5%. 12 so this you know, really motivated us and, and made us think that it was very important to move ahead with this work into later stage clinical trials. However, what we also found is that um, you know, there was a certain degree of skepticism in the field. And, and some of you, all of you are scientists in some way or another. And uh, what, we, what we heard from our colleagues is great. You know, how did you know that this was real reduction in scar size and real viable mass? So we went back to the lab and we did a, a large animal um, validation study because we couldn't bioprint a heart. And um, we were able to sort of do basically what we were able to look at in the humans. So heart attack, we did MRIs, just like the data that I showed you was from an MRI. And then we did uh, the data analysis. And I'm gonna show you what we found, which is in three different modalities. And these are examples of um, shown on going from far right to, to far left, um, a treated animal versus a, uh, I mean a control animal versus a treated animal. What you can see is, so in vivo MRI means that the pig was put in the magnet just like the patient was. They were live, breathing, and happy. And we looked at white versus black, which is scar versus healthy tissue. And then what we did to make sure that there was no artifact, no leakage of the dye, 
whatever. We then took the heart out of the body of the animal, and then we put the, just the heart into the magnet, and we were able to look at white versus black. And then finally, we were able to section the heart and do TTC staining, which is the stain that lets you look at living versus dead tissue. And what we found, and you can see as exemplified here, is irrefutable that there are these bands of healthy tissue that are surrounding, let's see if I can do this. Somebody warned me about this. Um, there we go. Okay. There are bands of healthy tissue in the treated animals that just don't exist in the, in the animals that, got the, that didn't get the cells. So this, this provided enough validation. This was published in, published in uh, several academic journals in various forms and, and various data um, to move forward with our clinical trial paradigm. Um, Additionally, we found um, in Caduceus that there were, although not clinically significant changes in volumes, these are labile measurements that are hard to do in a very small study, but there was enough indication that the cells had effects on volumes that um, we decided that um, a bigger trial would probably see relevant changes in these clinically endpoints. Okay. So how do our CDCs work? Um, they decrease um, apoptosis and death. They recruit endogenous stem cells to promote tissue growth. They stimulate uh, new cell production, and they improve um, blood vessel density. But they don't do this by going in and becoming part of the functioning system. They don't make the heart their home. They go in there and they function as a local drug delivery system, releasing proteins, um, what we now know are microRNAs, and a variety of other um, cytokines that um, allow the cell, the heart to repair itself, and they're eventually cleared from the heart. We know about four months later there's no cells left, at least in an animal model, and um, they have no side effects that we uh, know of at this point several years later. And uh, we know now that um, the CDCs are the only therapeutic that reduce infarct size and, and produce the regeneration of new heart muscle. However, Working with an autologous cell therapy was not that easy. Um, I always uh, tell people that if you were a patient in Caduceus and you came in, you'd had a heart attack, you're already worried about your health, we're told that you're told that you might be able to get something that can help you. You then come in and you get a cardiac biopsy, which is safe but invasive, you've spent your day in the hospital, and then we take your biopsy back to our lab and we do everything within our power to grow the very best cells that we can, but something goes wrong. Your cells don't grow to dose, or they don't have the right release criteria, or there is a manufacturing error and you have a sterility breach. Then instead of getting that call which says, come on back in and get your cells, you're getting that phone call saying, we're very sorry, we don't have cells for you. So that combined with the fact that providing um, adequate, what I felt was you know, moving forward, QA, QC, quality assurance, quality control, and also potency development um, of, a, of a relevant assay uh, became very difficult uh, with the autologous. So we moved to an allogeneic model, and I won't spend my time here telling you um, specifically about the cells, but we start with a donor heart, and um, we then move through the same steps that we would move through with a um, a biopsy, the only difference is we get many thousands of doses. It's frozen down, and it looks like this when we pull it out of the freezer in the cath lab, and it's been done several times today across the United States, so I know um, that it works, and the cells are pulled up into a syringe and delivered to a patient. This, uh, this switch from autologous to allogeneic led us to begin the all-star clinical trial. All-star, I call it caduceus with a kick. It's uh, looking at an expanded patient population. We have two cohorts of patients. Those are 30 to 90 days after a heart attack. Those that are 90 days to one year after a heart attack. Um, they not are included not only if they have a big heart attack, but also if they have, um, I, I mean, a cardiac function defect, but also if they have a big heart attack, because we now know that that makes a difference based on caduceus. And now we're uh, involved in the phase two study, which is a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial in about 30 sites in the United States. The phase one of All Star uh, was completed at the end of last year. Um, it met, uh, it was 14 treated patients. It was an open-label dose escalation study. There was no control group. Um, and uh, so we couldn't really, you know, do the apples to oranges comparison that we were able to do with Caduceus, but we're um, enthusiastic because in the early part of the data analysis, we've seen at six months um, a improvement in ejection fraction, that's how the heart works, um, as well as all of the other things I talked about with Caduceus, infarct size improved, viable mass improved, and uh, the regional function, that's the area around where the cells were injected and where the scar was, uh, it seems uh, the heart seems to be working better. So we're, we're pretty excited uh, by this data. We'll see uh, what the future will hold, and like I said, every caution that there was not a control group, uh, but this certainly looks like it's a definitely a, a relatively important path forward. 
So um, all stars underway, phase two cl clinical trial, like I told you, is 300 patients. I told you a little bit about it. We expect the data in 2016. It's got a one-year endpoint, so it takes a little while to collect all that. In addition, we're starting a new trial, and this should be starting uh, any time. Now we have NIH funding to do the phase one portion of this trial. This is called dynamic. These are sick folks. These are people with class three and class four heart failure. That means they're already in that advanced stage of the disease. Because they no longer have focal disease um, in one area of their heart, they have diffuse disease, we're going to be doing what we call triple vessel infusion. So we're going to be putting cells down um, all the different coronary arteries to try and bathe the heart in cells and see if we can get the same types of effect we saw in the single vessel, single site of injury disease. Um, we plan on uh, starting that trial this year. Uh, it will take a while to do the study and collect the data, so we expect it in 2015. And um, you know, look for that to be starting soon at two sites, uh, first being Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. So you know, this, this slide um, I, I made when I was actually sitting at another professional meeting a couple of years ago, and, and I realized that you know, we have a very unique approach in a very crowded field. And, and I, don't, um, I don't know what to say sometimes when we're asked, what's the difference between your cells and others? So I just you know, pull up this. This slide, and I say, well, we have an off-the-shelf product, we have a proof of concept in a clinical trial, we have a stable supply chain, we use donor hearts, um, so we get those from organ procurement organizations, and uh, the supply seems to be um, one that, that we can count on for many years to come. Uh, we have a great manufacturing model now with a cost of goods as low and a, a profit margin potential of over 90%. Uh, we work on our intellectual pro portfolio, and we have a strategic partnership. So what happened is, is Johnson & Johnson came in, and they did about 15 months of due diligence. Uh, 20 people came in and spent time reviewing all of our data, which I've just showed you, and more, to validate that, that the claims uh, that we had made regarding what the cells could do uh, were, in fact, real. And they decided to uh, ex put an option to license the cells at phase two. And there's all kinds of financial milestones that come with that. It's not the focus of this meeting, uh, but gives us uh, a sense of um, external validation of our technology and, and the path forward. So very crowded space. Um, interesting to see data coming out over the next uh, months and years in, in cardiac disease, but what we like to say is that our cells are, are very different, they're very unique, and we seem to have some really relevant biomarker data. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about exosomes, and I think I was doing some reading on exosomes yesterday. Exosomes are our think tank project. It's, it's in preclinical phase, which is the, the most fun part because there's all of the promise to come. We discovered exosomes made by our CDCs um, as we were looking for the mechanism of action of the CDCs. So, you know, one of the things that we try to do is try to figure out, okay, they're functioning as a local drug delivery system. I told you that a while ago. But how does that actually work? And so these exosomes were discovered in the lab. And then we started again, you know, went back to the literature and, and found that exosomes had been discovered back in the 80s and they were considered to be waste products of cells. And it's only really been sort of in a very iterative, slow moving and not very well publicized way has the role of exosomes as delivery vehicles for microRNAs and other proteins um, been elucidated. And I think I read yesterday that um, they went from 20 papers published in 2010 on exosomes to 450 published in uh, 2013 in exosomes. So people are catching on that these are interesting. Now, you know, they are, we did find, and I'll show you some data to substantiate in just a few moments, that they are responsible for a significant portion of the effect of the cells. But they're non-cellular. They're able to uh, be very stable. You can store them on a shelf. They're non-immunogenic, or so we believe. We'll have that data very soon. Um, they're very easy to deliver. Um, they can be delivered in multiple ways, and they cross the blood-brain barrier. So we decided to embark on a program of exploring these exosomes as our next stage therapeutic. Shown here is basically how, how they're made. They're made through the endosomal uh, fusion process. The most important thing to know about the uh, exosomes um, is that they are you know, recognized by the body, so they're made, uh, their membranes are um, like cell membranes, and so they can go and they can fuse to the next cell in the chain and, and open up and deliver their vehicles, and that's how they generally get the microRNAs between the different cells. So you know, I think a lot of people have been working for years on, on microRNAs, and in fact, um, if my next slide is what I want it to be, yes, if you have 
potential for seizures. Don't look at this slide, it always makes me a little sick. But um, the, the graduate student who made it uh, loved the fact that they were dancing in his dish. But what we found was um, when we first started looking at these exosomes that were released from the CDCs, we found that we, they had a unique microRNA profile shown in blue on the, on the right-hand side. Um, shown on the uh, left-hand side is the corresponding exosomes made from normal human dermal fibroblasts, those that are made from skin. Um, certainly have you know, microRNAs in them, but very different than the ones made by CDCs. The graduate student actually wanted to work for, um, towards isolating the relevant microRNAs and using those as a therapeutic, and it was just about then that the field was getting super crowded with microRNA companies that couldn't figure out how on earth to get these things uh, into the body and, and to work. And so I said, well, why mess with what works? The exosomes, you know, can bind and release. Let's just work on an exosome as opposed to the microRNA. And um, what you can see is that that experiment and that decision was very successful. So our model of choice is a model of, of a heart attack. Our, um, our mice are given a heart attack, and then we wait a few weeks and we deliver usually our cells, and our cells, um, we've got worked this down to a science, and we've done thousands of mice over the past 10 years, so we know exactly sort of how to calibrate the amount of cells and the size of the heart attack and all that. And so we decided to, to replicate uh, those experiments using the exosomes, and we were then able to replicate the data, which is very, uh, interesting and exciting to us. So shown here, up here in the, in the line chart, um, we're looking at ejection fraction. That's how well the mouse hearts functioned. Time uh, one, it, day one is the day that they all had the heart attack. And you can see, or the day after, I guess, um, the day um, their heart's uh, function is significantly reduced. Um, those that got the skin exosomes and those that got PBS controls continue to have a decrement of function, um, as one would expect after a big heart attack. Those that got the CDC exosomes did much, much better with a recovery of their heart function by a significant amount, um, you know, even up to 30 days after the delivery of the exosomes. And then shown in the two bar graphs on the bottom are exactly the data that I showed you from Caduceus, viable mass and scar mass. And you see again that um, with the exosomes, you see an increase in viable mass, very significant compared to the control, and even as significant um, when compared to the skin, uh, uh, the fibroblast exosomes, and same thing with scar mass. You see a, a significant, very significant reduction in the amount of uh, scar uh, when you use the exosomes compared to the skin or control PBS treated animals, and this is validated um, as shown by these uh, sample sections of hearts shown here where you actually can visibly see uh, less dead tissue uh, in the treated animal. This again um, is a, what we call a validation study. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Um, what we did is we used this compound called GW4869. That actually blocks the release of exosomes from cells. So uh, without walking you through um, all of the data, because I think I'm running short of time. Am I running short of time? Um, yes. Okay, so again, we did basically the same experiment. The, the mice uh, were given heart attacks. Um, they start off at the exact same point. Those, now they were, we were doing just a direct comparison of our cells versus the cells treated with the, this inhibitor. So it's now cells, we're not just isolating the exosomes, we're looking to do the exosomes participate in making the response. And again, what we saw is that the exosomes were um, highly responsible for um, the reduction in scar and the increase in viable mass because as you can see in the animals that were treated with cells that were the exosomes were blocked you didn't uh, prevent uh, the scar damage or attenuate the scar damage or cause the increase in viable mass. So this data all taken together showed us that the exosomes were a pretty interesting and, and relevant therapeutic to move forward with and so we're now um, sort of in, in late stages of, of planning um, a clinical trial that, that should commence you know, within 2015 or 2016, depending on manufacturing scale up and, and uh, the end stage of the preclinical work. But I can tell you now that we have um, not only a development paradigm, but we've done some large animal studies and, and those are looking very promising as well. So we're excited about this as a potential therapeutic. It's what we call a platform therapeutic. So we're gonna start in the heart, that's what we know. Um, that's how, um, we think that we can best make our first entry, but because of the broad implications of the exosomes, uh, we'll probably be able to look at many other indications and in, in many other organ systems as we move this therapy forward. 
Finally, I just want to, you know, say thank you uh, to my team. Um, we're based in Los Angeles, shown on the left are my, as our management team, uh, all seasons executives that are, um, have background in taking uh, therapies from bench to bedside in some way or another, and then my board of directors uh, who are all, again, uh, handpicked uh, specifically for their skills that they can bring to the table and help driving the company forward. So I hope uh, that was interesting to you. If you have any questions regarding the company, building the company, or our therapeutics, I'm happy to take that now.